And as, you get, as we get seated, I have uh, one of our deacons and a friend of mine, uh, Danny Eason, to lead us in prayer as we come into this time of the sermon and preaching. And so if you'll join us in prayer, Danny, would you lead us, please? Father, I just thank you so much. I thank you for your love. Dear Lord, I thank you for your grace and how you show that to us every day. Father, I thank you for giving us your word. And as our pastor preaches on your word today, dear Lord, I just pray that you would just keep a hedge of protection around him. I am so thankful for him, and I am so thankful that you've brought him to us. Father, I pray that he will have no distractions as he preaches your word. Father, and I just pray that you just prepare our church, you prepare our hearts right now for what you have for us. Father, that today lives will be touched, hearts will be changed, and we'll, we will be energized to go out and share the gospel to a lost world. Father, I thank you so much for Brother Justin and his family, dear Lord, and we just uh, thank you for the blessing that they are. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Danny. You can turn in your Bibles. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Is anyone else a little bit groggy from the time change? Even though allegedly there was an extra hour of sleep in there? Man. <laughs> yeah. So I apparently moved, removed the wrong bookmark. I, I had to find it too. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 this morning. The title today is Pray Better. Now that's not like an insult saying y'all aren't praying very well. I'm just saying but there's always room to grow in our prayer life with God. So I want us to pray better. I want to pray better. I want to walk with God in, in prayer on a regular basis and so I think it's time to take our prayer life to the next level. As we come to this text, it's kind of the focus of the next five verses. And by the way, it doesn't mean that I'm about to give you a secret to pray in a way that moves God's hand to meet our immediate earthly desires. I, I riffed a little bit on the title off of a book that I once was given and read enough of it to realize it was garbage. Uh, it was called A Better Way to Pray. Uh, and uh, so I'm thinking, oh, I want to, yeah, great, better way to pray. But the focus of it in a nutshell was something to the effect of you know, we don't have because we don't ask. And so we need to ask and, and move God's hand to accomplish what it is that it, that's on our heart. And without appropriately moving into the surrender to God who has a mission for us, it was more about taking what we want. And uh, I just, I don't put an enough, no, no, let me put it this way. I, I do not put the faith in us as humans with having the proper perspective about what God's will is and what God's best is. I trust him and I trust his word. And so I want to go and see what he says to us today. I hope you'll uh, follow along taking notes and just seeking like, how do we pray better? How do we have a better conversation with God? How do we know what to ask for? And so, hopefully, again, this, these next five verses, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, will be helpful. Let's read them together, or I'll read them to you, but all together, and then we'll unpack it. So, chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul, with Silas and Timothy, writing to the church at Thessalonica, having concluded two chapters of, of communication, of exhortation, we now come to this closing part of the letter where he says, in addition, brothers and sisters... Pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. May God bless the reading and now preaching of his word. As we look at verse 1 of chapter 3, he starts saying, in addition, 
brothers and sisters. And so in addition to what is kind of our you know, maybe automatic question, and just a quick reminder that it's, it's a reminder of the whole that has already been covered. Now we're moving to the next moment, the next section of the exhortation. So he begins to conclude the letter. Some translations read, finally, brothers. So therefore, he is getting to this end part of the letter, but it is part of the whole. So it's necessary. But he's changing gears. So let's tune in. He just showed that there was a contrast of those that are being deceived, particularly in the end times, but realizing that those being deceived go all throughout time with those, he contrasts those with those who belong to Christ, those who are being saved. And to those in Christ, he gave the instruction to stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught. So with a wonderful reality that our God will encourage and strengthen us, the church, to stand firm in every good work and good word. That's what he just finished talking about. And then he goes now in addition to that. So as Paul concludes the letter, let me also point out, he does say brothers and sisters yet again. Uh, really, the word in Greek is just brothers, but it's, he's referring to the church family. They often use just the masculine term, but referring to the whole church family. He, he recognizes the family nature that is adopted into God's kingdom. So there's this fatherly, brotherly, tender care for the church as he comes to the end of this letter. And he instructs them to pray. That's what he asks for. Pray for us. I say he asks for. Technically, this is an imperative. This is a command. He, he instructs them by command, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Speak to God. Ask of God. On our behalf, he says. Do you ever think about prayer in terms of making an appointment to speak with somebody important and actually showing up to that appointment? Have you, ever, have you ever been in a meeting with somebody that was relatively important as far as human standards go? What did it take to get that appointment? You know, I, I don't know, if, you've been, if you see a dentist in Canton, you know that sometimes just to get into the dentist, you have to make an appointment like three months out. And I don't think dentists are all that important. Oh, mm. okay, they're really important, but we don't like to see them, Right? And usually when we're calling because we need a quick appointment, when do we need to see them? Yeah. I'm dying, doc. And they're like, okay, we can see you in January. And you're like, no. I'm, I'm about to do something severe to stop the pain. So when it comes to coming to the presence of God, do we not realize who we are entering the presence of someone in authority, someone who can make a difference of the matter that is at hand. Paul understands that the Lord is the one that we are praying to, and he invites them, pray for us. Pray for us. Come to God seeking his favor. I just... I think we sometimes talk about prayer and we don't realize what a big deal it is that we can enter the throne room of the King of Kings and ask for his help to do what he calls us to do. But Paul clearly believes there's a real value for his brothers and sisters praying for him and his co-workers. And Paul, you could, you could argue he's one of the baddest dudes in the New Testament. And I mean that in a good way, if you're of an older generation, baddest means goodest. I'm really stumbling through this morning. It's got to be the grogginess. Would you all be patient and gracious with me? Paul was a serious, I mean, man, talk about a guy that walked with the Lord, was confident, courageous, and bold in the faith. And, and he is asking this church, no, instructing this church. Pray for us. Not just pray for you, pray for us. What were the things he asked for in this? Uh, that the word of the Lord would spread rapidly and be honored. So point number one, if you're taking notes there, pray for the rapid 
spread and the warm reception of the gospel, honored reception of the gospel. That's the prayer, specifically that the gospel would spread. Pray for us that the gospel would spread. That, in other words, we would be faithful to continue to communicate the message that though we're sinners, Christ died for us, trust him by faith and be born again and receive eternal life. Pray that we would keep going, that that message would go rapidly. The word of the Lord is what is described here, the content of the message about Jesus. So I summed it up in the word, the gospel. And it is helpful for us to see that the word of the Lord and the word gospel are really intertwined and much the same. We are proclaiming the message that Jesus was God's son, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. When we do that, we're proclaiming the word of the Lord. When we invite someone to become a follower of Christ, we're inviting them to become an adopted child of God by God's hand, which comes with this idea of surrender to the reality that He is God. So, so when we come to this point of believing that He is God, we come to His Word recognizing He is authoritative over us. So here, His Word is authoritative for us. So being a disciple of Jesus is more than just believing the message that we're sinners, Christ died for us, was buried and rose again. And I'm not taking away from that. But I'm saying when we believe that, that means something for our lives. It's a complete change of life. It's, it's someone that was dead, now alive. And so now that we're alive, what do we do? Well, we need the word of the Lord to instruct us. So it's part of the being made a disciple of Christ. The word of the Lord is a message of discipleship. It's part of learning to do all that God has commanded. And his prayer, his request from the church to pray for them was that the gospel, the word of the Lord, would spread rapidly. It's interesting, God does not need people to spread the gospel. But he uses people to spread the gospel. And he prays, asks them to pray that it would spread rapidly. Like, this is so important, and, and the, the word for uh, gospel here, or the verb for spreading, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the verb for spreading is a passive verb, meaning someone has to take it. He's saying he and his compatriots are taking the gospel, just as we are instructed to take the gospel and proclaim it. It be spread around. But this word, spread rapidly, it, it comes from a word that means running, in contrast to walking, how many of us take the gospel message seriously that we, we, are, we are getting up in the morning and going, running, how do I get this out to my coworker? How do I get this out to my family? How do I get this out to my neighbor, a neighborhood? He wants the message of Christ to spread rapidly like running to the cities and towns and villages around the world. Don't walk. Run. But we can spread the gospel. You all remember the parable of the sower that Jesus spoke, right? We spread the gospel. We, it's sowing seed. We, we throw the seed out. We, we toss it in many different places. But what is our hope? That the seed takes root. And it grows. He says that it would be honored. I, I say a warm reception. That it's... It's honored to, to, to honor something here is to speak of it and treat it as something that is unusually fine. It's to treasure something. So when the message comes to you that you're, though you're a sinner, Christ died for you, was buried and rose again, and he's alive today, calling you to his salvation, calling you into his family, won't you receive that? Our, our hope, our desire, and the thing we are praying for is that it would be received and treasured as the gift that it is. But so often we see that we speak that message and it is received and it's, well, eh. it's not treasured by many. 
But yet, we keep spreading it. We keep proclaiming it. And we delight when we see someone receive it and honor it. But he refers to how the Thessalonian church honored it. He says, you guys received it. He's implying that they received it and they treasured this message and they, they took it to heart and they became sincere Christ followers, children of God, in despite the reality that they faced persecution almost immediately, they continued to recognize that the treasure of the gospel was greater than anything in this life. It was greater than recognition. It was greater than financial well-being. It was greater than their life health, greater than their legal well-being. They hung on and treasured the gospel. So, Paul instructs the church to pray that the gospel would be received by faith and treasured as it had been with them, with the church at Thessalonica. So when, when we look at that and we see if Paul is asking for prayer, then we can pray better when we pray for each other, when we pray that God would use the people we're praying for to spread the gospel rapidly. And that those that they share it with, that it would be honored, that it would be treasured and received well. That's a strange prayer in a hospital room, isn't it? With someone that you love dying and suffering. Don't, don't we want to pray that God would heal them and, and allow them to continue on in life? I, I know I do and, and often pray that way. And maybe it, it, we should continue to pray for God's healing, but maybe we should also pray that as they endure this difficulty, as they endure this affliction, as the family members that are gathered around and, and wanting the best for this person that is in this difficult situation, maybe we should also be praying that, God, even in this, would you spread the gospel through these people? And those that they speak it with, would they see such a sincere faith and a love for, and an admiration for you, God, that they would, they would want that too, so that when they get a hold of it, they treasure it for the unusually fine, wonderful gift that it is. We can pray better. I'll even add, today in our, our world, our, our world is going crazy. And we see news reports and things happening. There's war in several places, and, and I think of Israel, and I've had pe several people ask, you know, shall we pray for Israel? Yes. Pray for Israel. But I, I wonder if we would improve that, if we would pray better. When we pray for Israel, that we pray that the gospel would spread among the Israeli people and be received as the treasure that it is. Don't forget that. Now, I know, I know what the Bible says about Israel and being God's people and, and God's movement later times, so I don't think we've seen that take place yet. But in that, it's still going to be salvation by grace. And so if we should be praying for the salvation of the Israeli people to put their trust in God. But you know, we also should be praying for the Hamas terrorists to receive the grace of God. And see, if they receive the grace of God, they'll stop being terrorists. Pray that the gospel would spread rapidly and be received well. Verse 2 continues, he continues asking for what they were to pray for, for the apostles, for the missionary team. He says that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not all have faith. The instruction to pray is continued, and he instructs them to pray, for point number two, pray for deliverance from evil people, evil and wicked people. I just shortened it up there. Pray for deliverance. Deliverance is the idea of being set free, rescued from something uh, that could include imprisonment, and certainly Paul's case and Silas and Timothy, that could have been a reality. Whether now or that's in the future, the, the, the horrible days of tribulation ahead for them, for those in the church in many places throughout history, or the tribulation to come. The, we would be delivered from evil people, and, he, and he, evil and wicked. So it's, it says wicked first. The word wicked means unusually bad or evil 
people, but it implies that they're so evil and wicked that they will commit harm. They will be violent in their hatred of you. Evil people, those who simply do not conform to God's moral standards. One of the synonyms for that is the idea of being sick or diseased. And we all know that one because when we were apart from Christ, or indeed when we choose sinful attitudes and behaviors and actions, we also realize that makes us sick and diseased. But there are people out there that we are going to spread the gospel to. We're going to proclaim the truth to. And it's not going to be the let's live and let live. Okay, that that truth is good for you, but I have my truth and you can just, we can just coexist. And we can indeed coexist. But there is one truth. But there are also people that we will spread the gospel to who are going to hate that message. And, and they're going to hate the one who that comes from. And, and so they hate the one who's delivering the message. And they might even want to do harm. I don't think anyone's ever tried to punch me in the face for preaching the gospel. That would have been a lot easier, right? I mean, there are people in countries going to jail for life that are being persecuted, starved, put to death, murdered for the sake of the gospel. And that is today somewhere in the world. Various places, for that matter. Some of the worst, I would say, that I've experienced, and maybe some of you, if you've ever gone door to door, if you've read someone threaten you to get off their property, they'll call the police. We've had that happen. Have you ever, and like, I'm not being rude, I just knocked on their door, and I come out, and like, as soon as I see a Bible in my hand, it's like, no, you're out of here. I'm like, okay. Others have slammed the door in my face. That's not really physical danger. But we might face physical danger even in our lives. And why don't we pray for those that are experiencing those things? Pray that God would deliver them, that he would allow the gospel to continue to be proclaimed through those people that he has given such courage to. But maybe it's because we haven't been faithful to spread the gospel that we haven't seen those reactions. And he says, they're wicked and evil people. Pray for deliverance from them, for not all have faith. The same word that's used for believe when it comes to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the same word, believe, trust him, put your confidence in him. That same word, for not all have faith, belief, confidence, assumed in Christ, implied in Christ. Because some do not have the faith, they're going to be particularly hostile and threatening to the advancement of that which would continue to expose their sinful hearts. And we as Christians know that when, when we sin and we, we know we don't want someone else to see that, we, when we come to church even and let the preaching of God's Word expose that, when we come to Sunday school class and God's Word is exposing that, when we're with a small group of people and God's Word is exposing that, we want to run far away. Or we want to act out. Get people to, don't look there. Don't open that door. We know what that's like for not all have faith. As we pray for others to spread the gospel and for its warm reception, understand that not all have faith. And not all will honor the gospel message. Not all will treasure it. And so we should pray that God would deliver others from evil people who hate his message and hate him. But we don't know who hates it until we're spreading it. So keep spreading it. Pray for each other. Ask for prayer from your brothers and sisters. And then I love the the quick word here. Almost, not almost. It is a play on words. Verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. So he ends verse 2 saying, for not all have faith. This is a word for belief trust, confidence, but the Lord is faithful. It's a very similar word, same root, but is a a different form of speech. So, but the Lord is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is reliable. He is worthy of putting our confidence in. Not all have faith, trust, belief, but the Lord is worthy of it. But the Lord is worthy of it. The Lord is faithful. faithful. 
What a word to remember. And and perhaps as we pray for one another, may we pray that we would be reminded and that we would hold to the reality that the Lord is faithful. He is characterized by steadfast affection. You see, God's affection for us doesn't change with our behavior. Y'all can, I'm, I'm, that's a sigh of relief. He is characterized by allegiance to himself, which is good for us because he doesn't lie. And he has offered this salvation through Christ, through faith, by his grace. And he is completely reliable. So point number three is this, pray with confidence in the Lord. Pray with confidence that the one whose presence we've entered, when we are asking something from him, pray with the reality that he is trustworthy. He will do what he said. We can ask him to do what he said. Now, his timing might be different than ours. But we can ask him and we'll be praying in alignment with his will. But he is faithful, so pray with confidence. And then it says he will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. I guess before I say that, I should add that, you know, the the Lord has never not been worthy of being trusted. He's never done something to cause us to not trust him. Now, some of us might say, well, hold on, I I prayed that God would heal so-and-so, and he didn't, and they died. So we might say, well, but there, God was unreliable because he didn't heal them. No, God was not being unreliable. He's being faithful. But his answer was no. Or Yes, but not in the way you expected. If it's a Christ follower who died, he healed them. But it wasn't the way we expected. You see, what's off often is our perspective, not God. So usually any disappointment comes from our own misunderstanding or our own unrealized expectations and generally incorrect expectations. The Lord is trustworthy, even when wicked and evil people react viciously towards us. The Lord is trustworthy, even when life seems to be falling apart. Even if you're like, I can't even pay my bills, and I thought God said He'd take care of us. I've been down that road. And you know, God used that hardship to teach me and my family a lesson on don't Go into debt. So the borrower is a slave to the lender conversation. And he used years of work to get out of debt to experience a little more financial freedom. And that doesn't mean that I'll never have financial troubles again. But I can look back and go, I don't understand why I was in a situation where I couldn't pay my bills and I was frustrated all the time and stressed out about money when I read that God meets your needs and will provide for you. But he did. And he provided for me in a way that changed my thinking, that helped me much greater than him just paying a monthly payment. And allowing me to get by the next two weeks. See, his perspective is bigger than mine. He is trustworthy. All that to say he is trustworthy. And then it says he will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And this is what he's particularly trustworthy in. To strengthen you, to make more firm, to be more resolved in your commitment. The same word that's found in Paul's prayer at the end of chapter 2, asking God to strengthen the church of Thessalonica for every good work and word. May the Lord strengthen you for every good work and word, he prayed. Same word, he will strengthen you. So I'm praying for it, and I'm confident he's going to do it. So let's pray that for each other. 
when we have needs, and we, we mention a lot of the physical things, let us pray that God would strengthen us, not so much uh, to make us better or to make life easier, to fix our immediate problem, but that He would cause us to be more resolved in our faith, more resolved to trust Him through this, to, to learn what He's teaching us, to hold on to Him, even when it seems like there's no good reason to hold on to Him. And I would argue that any one of us are just a few steps from being in that place. And in His faithfulness, in God's faithfulness and reliability, He will cause His people to stand firm when they need to. And He'll guard you from the evil one. He will keep watch over the idea of like a soldier on a night watch. But the thing is, God doesn't sleep. God doesn't need sleep. So unlike a night watchman who might get groggy, God doesn't. He will watch over you. The God who is all-powerful will provide protection. So if something happens to you that is unpleasant, that is affliction, that is persecution even, you are within God's protection. Oh, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to make sense. I don't really want to hear that. I want to read and interpret. And let me tell you, as a pastor, I want to read and interpret and tell y'all. Look at me become an East Texan, y'all. <laughs> I want to read this and interpret this to me. No harm will overcome you by our definition of the word harm. I'd like to tell you that. But I've seen... And I've read and I've seen in his word, many, many, many Christ followers have suffered painful, horrific things, and yet they were in God's protection. The protection may even be that they didn't fall away. They didn't forsake their relationship with Christ for the sake of momentary relief. Talk about protection. That's even more impressive. And ultimate protection. You remember when he says that don't fear the one who can hurt your body, but fear the one that can destroy soul and body in hell? Remember that one? That was Jesus' words. I always thought at first that that was talking about the devil that could destroy soul and body in hell. No, that's the Father. Satan doesn't have that power. So when he preserves us into an eternity of life with him, he has been faithful to protect us. Let me mention a few Bible examples of that without spending too much time on them. Job, you can read about in the book of Job. Just read chapter 1. Job suffered, maybe it's chapter 2, where Satan is limited by God. And do you notice in that story, Satan does not disobey God. When it came to, Satan's like, oh, oh, Job, he's only trusting God, he's only fearing God because you've given him so many material blessings. God says, no, he's my servant. You can do what you want with him, but don't touch him. Or his health. So does Satan go outside of that? No, he does everything he can where he had the freedom to reign, which means that God reigns. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their Babylonian names, Jewish exiles to Babylon, presented with an option to bow their knee to worship a golden idol that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up in Daniel chapter 3, you can read about it there, were strengthened to obey the Lord in the face of their immediate death. What would be? So much so that when they were tossed into a fiery furnace to die, like they did, God didn't just preserve them to keep them from going into the fiery furnace, they got thrown into the fiery furnace, so hot that it killed the guards that threw them in. And of course, we know this, you know, that's a good, that's a, that's a good one. 
God spared them. Show Nebuchadnezzar who's really in charge. See, he will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. He is faithful. That's the God who we call Father. Verse 4. Paul continues saying, we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. We have confidence in the Lord about you. We, we are persuaded that God is so faithful, he's going to continue what he started. Sounds like another verse Paul wrote. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And he says that you are doing, I love how he builds up the church in this process. You know, when, when, when you may not be doing exactly what you ought to be doing, but someone says, hey, you're doing what you ought to be doing. You know what I'm talking about? And they're like steering you that direction. What a, what a wonderful craftsman of words Paul was. <laughs> that you are doing what we command. You are following God's word and will. And, and he sees and recognizes what they are doing well indeed. That it is present, it is actively being done, it is continuously being carried out of what they commanded. What they commanded is what is the gospel, it is the New Testament. God is speaking. They, they were obeying God's word. And, and that you not only are doing it, but you will continue to do it. Praise God. See, there's confidence that those who are in Christ will continue standing firm in the faith and continue being faithful and obedient to Christ. And so may that be our prayer. When we pray for someone, we're praying, God, help this person be faithful to you. And in fact, I'm so confident because of how good you are that that's going to be answered. You will sustain them through it. So pray for others. Pray with confidence in the faithful, powerful work of the Lord in their lives. Let me ask you, when you pray, do you pray believing that? Do you pray believing that, that God is able to do what God says? Believe it. Have confidence in our God. Verse 5. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. So now he kind of turns and, and, and just speaks his own prayer back towards the church of Thessalonica. May the Lord direct your hearts. My hope, my desire is this for you, church, that God would make it straightforward and simple to walk in God's love. That God would influence their hearts to cause them to follow a course of action. So if you wonder what to pray about, verse, or no, I'm sorry, point number four, pray expecting his good response. Pray expecting his good response, just as Paul does here, saying, may the Lord direct your hearts to God's love. That's the hope. That's the expectation that as God moves in their lives, they will engage deeper in the relationship with God. That they would grow in their respect and admiration and affection for God. And by the way, men, that's not, a, that's not a girly thing to be affectionate with God. To admire God. To recognize Him for the truth of who He is. That is actually one of the most manly things you can do. I know we use this word love and in our culture it does kind of come across often as this, this soft... This is, an, this is an amazing thing. This is a difficult thing, a work of God in our lives for that matter. That's why it's expressed as part of a prayer. And he says, so I pray, my hope, my expectation, my desires, you would be directed into God's love. You would engage in that relationship with me, but also... God would direct their hearts into Christ's endurance. Kind of goes back to some of what we were talking about, the potential hardships, the, the attacks of evil people in life. Christ's endurance. What was Christ's endurance? Jesus endured this life as a human. He knows the pain, he knows the struggle. Jesus endured the cross, a punishment for a crime multitude of crimes that he did not commit. 
unjustly accused, brutally murdered. Christ's endurance. So if we're to be like Christ, that's got to come from the power of God. Y'all, if people went to put me on a cross, I can't do it on my own. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take much physical pain really. You begin to see what he went through. I, I, I'm not even sure I'd have made it to the cross. That's why it's a prayer. That's why it's an ex, a, a desire that he, he lifts up. May the Lord do this, that he would direct your hearts, make it simple and straightforward, that you would walk in God's love and in Christ's endurance. that God would be the one who empowers our faithfulness. So. It may not be the answer of comfort that we want to hear. <laughs> and the idea of God aiding us by directing us into His love, it's a good and wonderful response from God when we pray. <laughs> Yes, God, direct me into your love. May I know your character and your goodness and may I experience that, but also into his endurance. Yes, that's also a faithful and trustworthy response that God would answer for us, that we would endure whatever life has for us, whatever God has for us. So when we pray, let's pray expecting God to direct those that we're praying for into God's love and Christ's endurance. Let's pray those things. It might mean that we don't pray for the easiest outcome sometimes. Not the, the quick human response of alleviate all suffering. Let there be no more death. You see, there's a problem with that. Let us pray for endurance and faithfulness as people endure their afflictions, physical, mental, emotional, otherwise. Pray for the advancement of the gospel through whatever circumstances they're going through. And pray with the mindset that God is faithful and that He will respond in a better way than we even imagine. A way that one day we'll be able to look back on, even if it's in eternity that we're looking back going, wow. God, you are wise and good. So will we pray better than before? I hope so. I hope that we will pray with a mindset that the gospel must move forward and may it move forward rapidly. There are many people groups that still don't have any scripture in their language. And may we pray for deliverance from evil people, especially for those reaching those unreached people. But may we pray for each of us, even in our own church family, and those that we support and those that we know, and keep praying for the gospel to advance and for evil people to be kept at bay appropriately. And if God so chooses that that means that somebody, a Christian missionary, gets murdered, or even one from our own family for some reason, may it be because he has a plan for the gospel to be shown. But confidence in our almighty God to empower all of it, to accomplish his good plan, to work in his people, to do good works and have good words. But may the Lord work in us to do more than we ask or think. But let's expect his good response even when the outcomes are not what we expected. Let's pray better. Let's pray now. Father, I thank you for the encouragement of your word. I thank you for the instruction of your word. Father, I do pray you would help us to pray better. Lord, help us to recognize in these moments how we can be aligning ourselves with you. 
how we can be trusting you and recognizing the treasure of the gospel in our own lives. And God, I pray that we would be asking you, that we would be pleading with you to work in your people to be spreading the gospel rapidly. And Lord, that it would be received well. God, I pray that we would be delivered from evil people who would want to destroy us and shut us down. And God, I pray we wouldn't be shut down because of those actions. I pray that you would keep moving us forward, Lord, to recognize what is important to you and help us to always have confidence that you are faithful. And your response, your answer is always good because your character is always good. And if we don't see it or understand it in the moment, help us to trust still that you are good. God, would you use this people, use Lakeside Baptist Church, use the other churches, Lord, in our community to do what you want us to do. Help us to advance the gospel. May we be faithful followers of you, our faithful God. I pray that for us in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior, our living King, whom every knee will bow before and confess you are Lord. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.